Jonah chapter 1, verse 4. That's where you're going to be this morning. And uh, who here thus far would you say you've experienced or encountered uh, in some way the labor shortage that's going on in the United States? You probably have. Yeah, you probably felt it in some way. I didn't, like, at first they started talking about a labor shortage, and, and I'm talking, like, last year they were saying there was a labor shortage, and I didn't really see much of it, and then we went on vacation. And it was like every restaurant we went to, the dining room was closed because they didn't have enough people or, you know, they would, they would only let a couple of people in the restaurant, not because of COVID measures, but because of, you know, just not enough staff to wait the tables or whatever. And, and then we started progressively see it, it kind of got worse. Like the, even the customer service started to, started to tank because nobody wants to be there and because there's a labor shortage. And we went into this ice cream shop and there was this lady leaning on the counter with her back to, if you guys were me, then she's got her back to us and she's on her phone and she's just talking and it is not a business call. Okay. Like this is not like she's, you know, talking about, I don't know, whatever you would order an ice cream or something. That's not what she's doing. And she's just having this conversation and I had to like walk up to the counter and almost like tap on the counter and excuse me. And she literally huffed at me and hung up her phone and then came over and took her order very annoyed. We left out of there and there was this big um, obstacle course. And the obstacle course was like multiple stories. Instead of being like a course that you go through on level ground, it, was, it went up like three or four stories. And every story, they like strap you in. And then every story that you go up, there's like a ladder to climb and little planks that are wobbly or whatever. And so you're strapped in. And I want just to put in perspective, like level one was as high as the ceiling. And so you're like that high going through this obstacle course and then up again. I didn't want to do it because that seems foolish to me. But my kids, they wanted to climb this, uh, this obstacle course. And so I went in, and this is no exaggeration. I walked into this uh, place to buy tickets. They've got other things there. They've got laser tag and, and mini golf and some other things. And I walk up to the counter and there's this guy standing there and this is what he does. It's going to get awkward, right? He just stares at me. He is just full on. And I'm like, uh, I said, do you? Yeah. I'm like, Hey, I was like, we want to get, we want to do the obstacle course. Okay. Do we buy tickets? Yep. Dude, I can't buy it and sell it. Like, tell me, like, what do I do? You know, give me some instructions. I'm, I'm a business guy. And whenever these opportunities come along, I like to try to instruct my children. And we walked out of there and I'm like, do you know how much business they're probably losing? You know, you, you got us because we're tourists and, and, you know, we're already here. You know, we're, this is what we were going to do for the afternoon. So, but I can tell you this, when I go back, I'm not going to go to that place again. Like my, the taste in my mouth is bad. I'm not going to go back to that place because, because of the way that they treated me because of that customer service. Now, if I say that on a business level, you guys can all go, we get it, right? Ready? What do you think people's experiences of the church sometimes? Like I walked out of there looking at my kids and I was saying this to them. If they had even tried a little, it would, I mean, even if the guy was like a total bonehead and didn't know what he was doing and just messing everything up. It still would have been better than that. Yet how many times are the believers, the Christians, the church, that guy? Let's read Jonah together. This is going to get serious today. Hope you guys are ready. Are you ready for this? Yes. Jonah chapter 1 and look at verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. And then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, what do you mean, sleeper? Uh, arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And then they said to him, please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us and what is your occupation and where do you come from and what is your country and what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? 
For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And so they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, I'm in verse 13 if you're lost. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land. But they could not for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. And therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him in the sea. And the sea ceased from, raging, from its raging. And then the men feared the Lord. And the, uh, they feared the Lord exceedingly and offered sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we turn to you in Jesus' name and we ask you to take this time of worship and move in this place. Father, we're, we're excited and we're thankful for the, the music and you moving as we're singing to you. We pray now that you'd move through the preaching of your word. Father, we pray that you'd help us to see your word with fresh eyes. Even those of us who were here in the first service just an hour ago hearing the same message, Father, I pray that you would help us to see it afresh even again. It's your word. It's a living word, and we trust you, and we know that you can, and we pray that you will. We pray that you'll take over this place. We pray that your spirit will move in here. You've told us that we can ask you for your spirit, and so here we are right now, Father, asking you in Jesus' name to fill this place with your spirit, fill our hearts. Father, penetrate the parts that my words can't get to. Let us hear from you. We pray that you'd prick our hearts. Tell us what you want from us. And Father, I pray that we'd be humble enough to follow you wherever you'd take us. Father, I pray that even in this place today, right now in this little church in Ballardsville, Father, I pray new life would happen right inside of here. I pray for restoration. I pray for new life. I pray that your son would be glorified. Would you please help us lead us in true worship of you? In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, in verse 4, we see where we ended last week. But the Lord, right? Remember that that happened because Jonah was the good prophet. He went to King Jeroboam II. That was in Israel. He liked that. Who wouldn't like that? He had a, a wicked king. And God had been warning the people and warning people. And Jonah got the, he got the prophecy. Go to the king, Jeroboam II. Go tell him that the Lord's going to restore some of the land to him. And Jonah did what he was told. Remember, we read that from 2 Kings. Jonah went to Jeroboam II. He gave him that message. And then it's almost like Jonah, the book of Jonah starts out at the end of that. The, the, the Lord says, and the word of the Lord came. Like it's a connecting thing. Like this is connected to something else. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah. This is now the second time the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah and told him to go to Nineveh. Rise and go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go to the Assyrians. Remember, he was in Gath Hefer, and re remember the map? He went down into Joppa, and then he was trying to go all the way across. He was going to go from Joppa and go all the way to Tarshish. He was running as far as he could run. He was supposed to go that direction and go to Nineveh, and instead he's going that direction, and he's going to go as far as the known world at the time. He was going to go all the way to the bottom of Spain and go all the way across the map. It's right in the middle of that. He, remember, he bought the ticket, he paid the fare, and he gets on the boat, and then we pick up, but the Lord. He's, Jonah's trying to run from God, but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Don't take that lightly. That's a, that's a huge, you understand, this is a raging storm that they're in the middle of. This is not a rocking boat. I don't know, if, did anybody watch those Alaskan crab fishermen shows on Discovery? Like, that's what I keep thinking of every time, I, you know, just like these ships being tossed, like waves totally crashing over top. And it says the boat's about to be broken apart. You can imagine things are probably breaking off. There's probably pieces of wood that are getting snapped off. The waves are crashing. The rain is coming down. And these mariners, these guys on the ship, that this is their job. In verse 5, the mariners were afraid. They're so afraid that every man starts to cry out to his God. They're obviously polytheistic, right? They obviously believe in different gods. And so they're all crying out to their own God. Seeing if any of them will stick. They're going to throw it at the wall and see what sticks. What God will answer them? Everybody's praying to their own God, asking that, that the sea would be calmed down, but nothing's working. 
So they take it even a step further. Look what they do. And they threw the cargo that was on the ship. They throw it into the sea to lighten the load. That's not a small thing either. That's probably the whole reason they're sailing. They probably left port for the sole reason of taking this cargo to another area. That's where their money is. By the way, no extra charge for this, but I do want to tell you something. It's funny how worthless things of this life become when you're facing death. That's true. Like what, what happens, we put a lot of value on things until we face death. And then all of a sudden, that value doesn't seem to be there anymore. They start throwing, this is precious cargo. This is their money. This is their livelihood. The whole reason they set sail, they start chucking it off the ship. The waves are so bad. The storm is so bad. The boat is going so crazy. They don't want to capsize, make it lighter, throw the cargo off. And in the middle of all of that, what's it say? But Jonah had gone down to the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. Tell me that you don't see a picture of what's happening in our world right now. The world is falling apart. Like, it's falling apart so bad. I want everybody to pay attention. It's falling apart so bad that this isn't like crazy Christian guy with a sign on the side of the road, the end is near. No, everybody can look around and say, something's up. Something's going on. Like there's something bigger happening than just what we see. I mean, what, we've been through wars before. These mariners have been through storms before, don't you think? They've had crashing waves before, don't you think? But this one's so bad, they can recognize this is something supernatural. They're praying to their gods. They're throwing over their cargo. They're trying to figure out what in the world is happening. Are you listening to me? The whole world outside can look around and they can see something is so bad. Something is so wrong. Something is happening. And they're grasping at any answer they can grasp for. And you ready for this? The church is asleep. You can clap. That's right. The world falls apart, and where's the church been? I'm going to challenge you with this. I believe the bigger the issues have been, the quieter the church gets. Right. It's like the bigger it has, the more people are involved, and the bigger the crowds get on the other side, because they're all grasping for straws. They're trying to find an answer. And somehow in the midst of all the craziness that's been happening, even the past couple of years, but even the past few decades, somehow the church just went quiet. And the more that goes on, the more the church just quiets down and says, nope, we're going we're gonna to concede that. We'll, we'll give that one up. We don't want to fight that. We don't want to fight that battle. We don't want to hurt people's feelings. We don't want to offend anybody. We certainly don't want to run anybody off. We're too scared of those things. And the church has been asleep, by the way, in the lowest parts. It's amazing to me what the church has decided to agree with. It's amazing to me what the church has decided to side with without even checking into it. Like, how far do I want to take this right now? Y'all, <laughs> I just want y'all to know this is fresh for me too, but I'm just like, <laughs> first time I'm hearing it right, but can, can you stick with me for a second? Like, isn't it kind of amazing what the church has got to the lowest, lowest common denominator with everybody else? And we seem to think, all right, ready? I'm just going to do it. We seem to think there's answers in Black Lives Matters, and we seem to think there's answers in vaccines, and we seem to think that there's answers in homosexuality and free love. But at the end of the day, none of those things are ever providing any answer. Amen. The storm keeps raging, and it keeps getting worse, doesn't it? Yep. And where's the church been? Asleep. I'm going to tell you all a story. There's a game that happens at my house. It's called Pit. You guys ever played Pit. Some of y'all have, some of you haven't. If you haven't, I'm open, there's an open invitation right now to not tomorrow. Do not flood me with text tomorrow. You all do not know how many texts I get on a Monday. It is really, sometimes it's hard, it's hard to deal with sometimes. Sometimes I have to like put my phone away and just leave it and then come back to it later. And it'll seriously say like 105 messages and I just have to scroll through them and try to answer them all. So, so just like another day, text me. Give me at least till Tuesday if you've never played Pit and we will get together and we will play Pit and you will love it. If you want to know how wild a card game can get, you got to come play Pit. Here's how Pit goes. i got to describe it so you can understand the story. The, the game Pit is a card game. It's based off the stock market. And you get nine, like the goal is to get nine of the same cards. So, so they have like, they have a commodity, a bunch of commodities. So they have wheat. You have nine cards that say wheat. Are you with? So I know you're not asleep. How many cards? Nine. 
Nine. nine cards. And they say wheat. And there's nine cards that say oranges. And there's nine cards that say soybean. And there's nine cards that say coffee. You're getting the idea. You shuffle those cards up and you deal them to everybody at the table. And then everybody, somebody rings the bell and the pits open when you ring the bell. And then you blind trade. You're looking at your cards and you're saying, I'll trade two. I'll trade two. And people around the table are, I'll trade three. I'll trade three. I'll trade four, whatever. And when you finally lock eyes with somebody, they're like, I'll trade two. I'll you're both, everybody's yelling at once. And two people lock eyes. You're like, I've got two. I've got two. Then you trade two for two. And the goal is to keep trading until you can make all your cards the same nine cards. You get the idea? So the game's about a 10 minute game. Takes 10 minutes ish, 10, 12 minutes at most to play through pit and get, finally somebody gets a card and then they ring the bell. You know, when you get the, all the, all same nine cards and you ring the bell and everybody else drops their cards like, oh, I was so close and who had weed or whatever. And that's, that's the way it kind of goes. Well, one night the game just goes on. It's been like 15 minutes. And by the way, 15 minutes of everybody yelling at the top of their lungs and passing cards and slamming the table with cards and trying to pass back and forth. 15 minutes gets to be really long. And then it just keeps going, like 16 minutes, 17 minutes. It gets to the point we're all breaking up our sets. We're all like, all right, fine, I'll break it. I'll give you four. Who'll give me four? And we're trying to, we're just doing anything to try to get out of this. And it goes 18, 19, maybe 20 minutes. And we are getting exhausted at this game. And finally we look over and Jeremiah, my son, (laughs) is just grinning. And Elijah goes, what did you do? And he tips his cards down. He was holding one of every card. (laughs) Now listen. There's no way to win. We needed nine. We all had to, the most we had was eight. You ready? The Christians are the ones holding the cards. Amen. Are you with this? The, the world's searching. The world's looking. And we're supposed to be the ones with answers. As a matter of fact, even in this text, look what happens. Look what happens in this text. In verse six, the captain came to him and said, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call upon your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. Isn't that interesting? The captain had to go wake him up. What do you mean by this? Get up, pray to your God. Do you notice we never actually see Jonah go pray? Isn't that interesting? It's probably because he already knew the answer. He already knew what was going on. Friends, I'm telling you, we're the ones holding the cards. And we're watching as the world is scrambling, trying to figure out what the answers are. And they're looking in every other direction, whether they look to the government or whether they look to love or relationships or what maybe they, some people are even trying to look to the church. And this is where the worst part of it is, is what happens next. Look what happens in Jonah's story, because this is what I think happens when people come look to the church. Look what happens in verse seven. They said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Stop for a second. Don't just glaze over those things. Can you imagine? These guys are heathens. They are polytheistic. They believe in all kinds of different gods. They don't know what's happening. They've thrown all their cargo over. They go and cast lots, whatever that means. Some people think it's like a dice type of thing. Some people think it's like drawing straws like we did in here the other day. I don't really know what exactly casting lots means, but whatever it was, it was something to point them to whatever they needed to investigate. They cast lots and they point to Jonah. Tell me that's not providence. And can you imagine from their perspective The waves are still crashing. The rain is coming down. This was the dude sleeping in the bottom of the boat. So can you imagine when they cast lots and they point at him? You. Like I can only imagine that their heart was probably in their throat. So they ask him, they say, tell us, tell us who are you? And I'm in the, I'm in verse eight, tell us who you are and, and where you've come from, what people of what people are you? And in verse nine, look what he says. With no hesitation, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Imagine with me, they're playing a game of chance and casting lots. If they had fell on the Egyptian guy, what would the Egyptian guy have possibly said? He probably would have said, hey, my name is is so-and-so, and I worship Ra, the sun god. That really wouldn't have matched up, would it? They're in the middle of the sea. The waves are crashing. Can you imagine? They're in the middle of the sea. Waves are crashing. They throw the lots down. They point at Jonah. They say, you, what is happening? And he says, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord. And my God is the God who made the the sea and the dry land. Oh. How how long is Jonah going to go before he tells them? 
Like Jonah wakes up from his slumber, he's rubbing his eyes, they're throwing things over the ship, and they go and start casting lots. Where's Jonah? We went to the beach. I had never been to the beach. I was 27 years old, had never gone to the ocean, never been to the beach. And so 27 years old, we were going to the beach for the first time. We were going to Destin, Florida. And so we go to Destin, and it's beautiful. It was, we just loved it there. We fell in love with it there. Sarah and I, it was just our, one of our favorite places to go. Take the kids there and go lay out on the beach. One of my favorite things about the beach is that people leave you alone. They're like, no, he's at the beach. <laughs> but really what I mean is like, I'm going to lay around and do nothing. <laughs> like, that's great. <laughs> it's funny, if I say I got a chore, then people call me. But if I'm like, I'm going to the beach, everybody leaves me alone. I don't know how that works. So I get, we go to the beach, and, and it's beautiful. But there's no seashells. We wanted to go collect seashells. I'd never been to a beach. And so I'm like, oh, there's going to be seashells. We'll go collect them. You can't hardly find I mean, like little tiny things in, in Destin. There's just no seashells there because the sand is so soft. And so we go a couple of days and we wanted to go search for seashells, but we couldn't. And one day I decided to take Titus out into the water. And so I scooped Titus up and I'm holding him, you know, this high. He was a little boy at the time. He was a little three-year-old, maybe two-year-old boy. And so I'd scooped him up and I'm holding him. And so he obviously can't swim. And we get out into the water and we're about chest deep in the water. We're, he's probably like, he's head level with me. I'm holding him up and the water's probably here. And I look down and under my foot is a giant seashell. It's like as big as this Bible. No exaggeration. It's like that big, huge seashell under my foot. And my daughter, my oldest daughter, Rebecca, she is like as far from me as to me to that microphone. Like she's that far away. And so I'm holding tight. So I was like, Rebecca, Rebecca, she turned and ran. She just starts swimming as fast as she can swim to try to get back to shore. And I'm, I'm like, Rebecca, come here. She's swimming as hard as she can. I got so mad. I'm trying to like kick the I was trying to kick it up and then it got buried as like another wave came and then it just got buried under the sand and then I lost it. I couldn't find it. So I'm carrying Titus. I'm so annoyed and I come back to the shore. And by the way, for those of you who say that I don't end my stories because I left you hanging with Marmaduke last week, he's fine. He just had a cough and he th made himself throw up. Okay, that's Marmaduke. So this story, I just want to tell you that 20 minutes later, some dude comes out of the ocean. He's like, honey, look what I found. And he had my daggone seashell. <laughs> Before that, though, I get back to the shore, and I'm holding little Titus. And I put him down. I was like, Rebecca, what, are, what happened? Where did you go? And she goes, I thought there was a shark. <laughs> Hold up. Wait. I was, I was mad about the shell for a second, but you thought there was a shark? And you, you couldn't even take your brother? Like, good to know I, you got my back. I mean, like, I was, at that point, I was mad for a whole different reason. Like, I thought she was running. I don't even really know what I thought she was running from. And then to find out she thought there was a shark and she ran the other direction and didn't even take little Titus with her. Let us both die out there. Hold up. Wait. We're get, you see what's happening again, don't you? What about us? Like, we see the world that's searching and we see the world that's asking. And then what happens? See, you and I know a reality that the rest of the world, they're, they're still unsure of. You know, there's a reality that set it in my head over the past year, which is that this death thing is really super permanent. Like, we all know that death is permanent, but then when you got to go home at night and you still see the same empty bed again, and you realize that that's the way that it is. Like, there's a real permanent thing we're talking about. And the whole world, all of us, we all face that same thing. We all face death. Can you imagine going through all of this and still not knowing what happens after death? And the church been running the other way. Where was Jonah this whole time? They're all searching. They're all casting lots. Where's Jonah? The lots fall to Jonah. And they say, hey, who are you? And he says, I'm a Hebrew. I know the God who created the land and the, and the sea. And then he goes on to tell him he had run. It says in verse 10, then they were exceedingly afraid. And they said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the, presence of, from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And in verse 12, and he said to them, just to stop for a second. We know the story, right? You know the story, right? Don't fall asleep yet. If, does that seem like the reasonable measure? If this was you, you had run from God, you went down to, from Geth Hafer down to, down to Joppa, you tried to flee to Tarshish, the, the seas are raging, they had to throw everything overboard, and they say, what do we do? I don't know, crazy idea, turn the boat around. Like, wouldn't that be the thing? That'd be the natural course of events. If it was me answering the question, I think we should turn the boat around. 
Maybe I should pray and repent. We'll turn the boat around. But instead, Jonah says something different. Jonah says in verse uh, 12, he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. And then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Jonah's answer is that they should pick him up and throw him into the water. And then the sea will quiet down. By the way, that seems like the most unreasonable thing. Of all things that could possibly calm this thing down, throwing a dude into the sea just doesn't seem like the thing that's going to do it. They've already thrown cargo over. That didn't work. Now they're saying throw, throw Jonah over. This is what I love that the Bible does in the story of Jonah. And I need everybody to pay attention to this because this is where the transition happens. This is when Jonah, the story of Jonah, becomes a typology of Christ. Did you hear what I said? For those of you who are new and you're like, what's a typology? A typology is something from the Old Testament that pictures Christ in the New Testament. And don't get all bent out of shape about Jonah being rebellious and running from God. You don't have to equate that part with, with Jesus. That's not how typologies work. Like there can be a typology of a thing and not every little part has to match up with some life, some part of the life of Jesus. That's not how typology is. You say, well, how do you know that? Because Jesus told us that this story matched with his life. When they asked Jesus, the Jews came to Jesus and they said, we want a sign. Jesus said, no sign will be given except what? The sign of Jonah. Just like Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a well, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Well, listen, Jonah, and when he's speaking, he's saying the one thing that only he knows. The rest of these guys, the rest of the mariners, they don't know what the answer is. He knows the answer. Somebody's got to die. I want you to hear this again. The world's going crazy and the world's falling apart. The world's breaking apart at the seams. And I tell you that we know the answer. That's not a blanket like, oh, we know the answer. No, no, friends, we know the actual answer. And the answer isn't, oh, you need to go to church or you need to sing the songs with us or you need to give more. Friends, the answer is this. We're falling apart because of sin. And if you try to turn the boat around, you can't do it. You can't turn this boat around. It's too big. But God, in his infinite love and his infinite wisdom, God sent his only son, Jesus. You see, somebody had to die. God sent his only son into the raging waves of this world that Jesus could take our punishment upon himself and he could offer us peace. You want to see it? Look at uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. I'm pretty sure I'm giving you the right reference, but I'm going to double check. Yeah, Colossians 1 and 20. Go ahead and turn there. Colossians 1 20 says this, And by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. You ready? Having made peace through the blood of his cross. See, God looked down and he saw our earth that is falling apart at the seams. And he gave us the answer. Jesus Christ, the son of God, came here and he died. He slayed his life down so that we could have peace. Uh, don't, don't say that like that's not a blab it and grab it sermon that's not me trying to say like oh you know if, if you if you trust in the lord then your whole life gets put back together and everything's perfect no that's not it at all no if you trust in christ then you have eternal life and no matter what happens in this world it doesn't even matter anymore because i'm waiting for something even greater Amen. see god has offered you a gift he has offered you his own son jesus that if you would put your trust in him if you would put your faith in him that he would save you that's where salvation is found. And I get it. Some of you are new and you're like, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. Like, why can't we do it a different way? Look at what happened in this story with Jonah. Come back to Jonah chapter one. Look at verse 13. Jonah says, pick me up, throw me over the edge. This was the same dude sleeping in the bottom. The same dude that the lots fell to. Look what verse 13 says. Nevertheless, the men rode hard trying to return to the land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. Do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. 
Here they are. They're, they tried. They grabbed the oars. They're going to row. They're going to try to get it back to shore. Can't happen. That's not the answer. There's a, I'm not going to say it right. I tried to look up how to say it. I can't pronounce it. But there's a story I remember from high school about this uh, town in Austria called, I'm going to call it Fieldkirk. Have you guys have heard of that little, little town? It, it, it's got a weird French sounding name that I can't get it out right, but my country mouth can say Fieldkirk, so that's what you're getting. Okay, so, uh, so this little town called Fieldkirk had about 4,000 people in it. And in, I think it was Easter of 1799, um, Napoleon was coming through and he wanted to take area that was behind, Fieldkirk was in the way. So Napoleon gives his army orders, his general orders to just take Fieldkirk out, just wipe him out. So this general lines up 18,000 soldiers on the hillside against Fieldkirk. The town wakes up Easter morning to see Napoleon's army off in the distance, gathered up with an army that they know they cannot match. And the people of the town came together and they said, what in the world do we do? They were kind of rushing around scrambling and somebody came up with the idea that said, walk over there with a white flag, offer them the city, offer them all the men of the city. They can do with us what they please, just spare the women and the children. That was their answer. We're just going to go and submit and hopefully they won't kill everybody. They won't kill even the women and the children. Hopefully we'll be able to, to make it through as well, or at least the women and the children could survive. We're going to go over there and try to submit. And there was an old man in the town and he said, well, before we do that, he said he'd like to suggest that the Lord's always brought him through everything before and the Lord was mighty enough to raise Jesus from the grave. It was Easter morning. He suggested they go ahead and go to church before they submitted. And so they did. This is a true story. They rang the church bells and all the people went ahead and gathered in the church. The general of the army of Napoleon heard the bells ringing and somebody started a rumor and said that the Austrian army had come in and was going to defend Fieldkirk for them. And so they decided that it wasn't worth the battle, like this little town wasn't worth the battle. And within 24 hours, they packed up all their stuff and went the other way. And if you look in a history book today and you look about Fieldkirk, you know what it'll say? It'll say the victory of Fieldkirk. Did they fight? Did they battle? Nope. I want you to hear this. God's not asking you to fight the battle. He's not asking you to row back to shore. He has offered you his son, Jesus. And if you put your faith in him, he's the one who saves you. Look what happens. I'm finishing the story. We're in Jonah 1 and verse 15. So they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now, I want you to think reasonably about this. They've thrown all the cargo off. They're still on a ship. The, the storms were raging. They pick up Jonah. They throw him off. And the Bible says that the storm ceased. Can you imagine the storm clouds start to spread out and the boat starts to settle? By the way, I still feel like there's got to be somebody on the boat that watched Jonah. Like That's got, that's got to be a moment. <laughs> this thing just swallows them all up. And that, that's, every time I think about it, I just can't, like, I, if I was the guy on the boat, I'd be like, he just ate him, <laughs> like the fish. <laughs> we'll get there next week. Because as the, as the boat settles, I love as I read some of the higher critics, some of the, which by the way, higher criticism in theology is bad. You hear me? Higher, if you ever read about higher criticism, that's bad. You say, I don't know what that is. Good, stay away from it. That's the stuff that just tries to disprove the Bible. And they love to take something like this and they go, well, how in the world did they make a fire on a ship? I got a crazy idea. Maybe they weren't on the ship at all. Yeah. What it says is that they were so impressed. They were so, look what happens. They throw him in the sea in verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. They're not on the ship making a fire. It made such an impression what happened, what they witnessed, what they saw, that when they got off the ship, they went and worshiped the Lord. Here's these polytheistic men who had been worshiping other gods and praying to other gods. And when they throw Jonah off and they saw that the seas ceased from their raging, they were so impressed by that, that when they got off the ship, they went and found some synagogue. They went and found some place of worship and they made a sacrifice and they worshiped God. That's exactly what God wants from you. When you see his power, when you taste and you see that he is good, when you've experienced his goodness, when you hear of this, you know what God, you know what God wants from you? He wants you to worship him and no other. 
He wants you to get off the raging sea. He wants you to get out of that mess. He wants to offer you peace in your life. I'm telling you, he's offered you peace. Peace with himself. You don't have to be his enemy anymore. He wants you to come and to worship him. So I'm going to close with this last question. Have you done that? Or are you still trying to row to shore? Are you still trying to fight your way back to him in some way? Friends, the battle's won. He's already offered the victory. If you'll put your trust in him, he's the one who does all the saving. How about we all stand up on our feet? We'll go to him in prayer even right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, your precious son, that you have offered us the gift of salvation. Father, thank you that you don't ask us to row back to shore. Thank you, Father, that you don't forsake us when we've been quiet and we've run from you. Father, thank you that your mercy extends beyond the day of salvation and even in the church that should have been speaking up all of this time. Father, I thank you that you've had mercy on us. I even thank you that we're still here to have another chance to tell others about you. So, Father, for your church, for your be the believers, for your children, I pray that we would be on fire. I pray that we would wake up and come out of the lowest parts of the ship. And, Father, that we would do our job. I pray that we would have a fire inside of us from your Holy Spirit that could not be quenched. And, Father, I pray for those who are in this building right now or watching who don't know you as their Savior. Would you please reveal yourself to them? That you were the one who gave your own life that we could have life in you. Thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for his blood and his body that was broken for us. Father, I pray that if somebody needs to make a decision, I pray that they do it right now. Lead them unto yourself. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.